Welcome back to the Anxiety Slayer podcast. I'm Shan Vanderleek, and today I'm speaking with Scott Shute about his new book, The Full Body Yes, Change Your Work and Your World from the Inside Out. Scott's intention is to mainstream mindfulness and operationalize compassion. In other words, bring these ancient and everyday concepts to the business world in a way that is secular and inclusive. Welcome to Anxiety Slayer, Scott. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you. And I really enjoyed reading The Full Body Yes. I wish I had a book like that back many moons ago when I was in the corporate world. I've been out of it for a while now, and that would have been a very helpful read for sure. (laughs) So (laughs) so I'm glad it's, yeah, absolutely. Uh, How does The Full Body Yes help readers learn to mainstream mindfulness? Well, there are different parts to it. So mainstreaming mindfulness is all just about making mindfulness or meditation or self-awareness practices just as normal in our everyday life as physical exercise. And this is mental exercise. And in today's world, especially in the workplace, you know, in the information age, most of us are not moving boxes. We don't need to bench press twice of our weight or run a six minute mile, but nearly all of us need to be emotionally stable and mentally focused and mentally stable, and mentally healthy at work. And so this is, this is where we're headed. Now, the book is part of that exploration. It's, it's fun as you know, it's, there's a bunch of stories in there that help us kind of get in touch with ourselves and realize how these practices are so important to all facets of our life, including work. It seems like it's been compartmentalized until recently and and probably still is in many, many places. But over the, I guess it's been 16 years now since I left my corporate job in television advertising. Mm. And uh, and that business itself, of of course, has changed. and, And I've seen a lot of improvements since since I moved on because I wanted to be more mindful and develop and develop my inner life. And uh, my yoga practice is actually the catalyst for, for uh, helping me leave. (laughs) So, (laughs) (laughs) you know, yeah. And so I, I think about how lucky the, the young people are now that will be going into the workforce to have options to be able to bring their inner life and mindfulness and the things that are important to them to their jobs. And then of course, it, it's the matter of also the, the folks who are employing them to, to go along for the ride. I, I love your, your LinkedIn story and how you basically created a role <laughs> for yourself yes. inside, inside <laughs> a company that was already doing a lot of things really well in, in, in mindfulness and, and kindness and and so on. So you're you're welcome to share a little bit about that if you'd like. Sure. Well, sure. I so I've, I I call myself a bit of a dual agent. On the one hand, I've had this career, you know, as an executive at LinkedIn. My my original job at LinkedIn for six years, I was the VP of Global Customer Operations. So I was leading customer service and all of the customer facing things that weren't sales. And it was a big team, like a thousand people. And had this other track where I've been a seeker and then a teacher. I, I started a practice when I was 13. I've been teaching since I was in college. Uh, outside of work, something I never talked about at work was that I'm a member of the clergy. Mm. Uh, and it's been a big part of my life. But it's not something I ever talked about at work until I got to LinkedIn. And I realized what an open place it was. Our CEO seven, nine years ago, it was talking about his own practice using Headspace. And I thought, well, maybe this is a place where I can bring some of my practice in a totally secular way. Right. right sure. And so I had a conversation with my friend who, who leads wellness and I was asking him about things we did with meditation. And he's like, wait, wait a minute, do you do something? I'm like, well, you, I could, I could do something. And we both got really excited. <laughs> he got really excited because here was this VP who was going to lead a wellness program. Like, all right, amazing. And, and we, I got really excited and I went back to my desk and I did nothing about it for three or four months because I was terrified. Sure. I was, you know, I had all this ego stuff like, what, what are people going to think about me? 
you know, what, uh, what is this going to do for my brand? Are people going to think I'm, you know, fill in the blank. Right. Sure. Part of that was born because I grew up on a farm in Kansas. And when my brother and sister and I found this practice, my parents thought we had joined a cult. They wanted to have us deprogrammed. <laughs> and so we, we learned to, to cover that part of our lives. But I finally, I finally got over myself and I led my first practice. It was on a Thursday afternoon at 4.30 in the, yeah, get this, the heavenly conference room, which I right on. thought was quite auspicious. And that first time there was one dude there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. And you're like, okay, well, yeah. it's a start. Here we go. I'm sure he was just as terrified as I was, but uh, uh, I never saw him again. But I came back the next week and there were three people and then there were five and that was a regular thing. And then people knew that I did it. So I got invited to bigger things. Our, C our CFO uh, had a big finance summit with three or 400 finance people. And I kicked it off with a meditation. Yeah. Like, just let that sink around a little yeah, bit. Think about that's that. It's so powerful. It's, and it's so right? needed uh, across the, the corporate landscape for sure. Absolutely. And then I volunteered to be our executive sponsor for the program. We didn't really have one. So myself and a bunch of volunteers created it. And I did that for three or four years. But for me, the tipping point was our CEO, Jeff Weiner, gave the commencement address at Wharton three years ago. And he talked about compassion, you know, and, and here he, the, Wharton's a very buttoned down place, right? Mm -hmm. And here he is kind of coming out talking about compassion, a very brave thing to do. And then the next day he's on TV. This is all the reporters want to talk about is compassion in business. And so I was thinking, okay, it's time. I'd been in my ops role for six years. I was ready for a new challenge. And our CEO essentially just told our 16,000 employees that the most important thing that they could do was to be compassionate. But what does that even mean? Yeah. And so I made a pitch to him and our head of HR and essentially created this role three years ago, head of mindfulness and compassion programs. Yeah. Congratulations. That's big work. Thank well, you. It's just fantastic. And it's, you, you talk about maximizing the things you care about. And as an entrepreneur, maximizing the things I care about is one of my superpowers. But, yes. but how can people achieve this who, who have a job outside of LinkedIn or a career where they report to somebody else that might be a little bit more closed to this way of thinking? I think that no matter where we are, we can shift our jobs. Or if we can't shift our jobs, then maybe we shift literally into a different job. But for me, one of the tools that I have found useful is this Japanese concept called Ikigai. And some of, some of you all know, it's the intersection between four circles. And Ikigai essentially translates into purpose for living. And it's these four circles. The four circles are what I love to do, what the world needs, what I'm good at, and what someone will pay me for. Mm. So what I love to do, what I'm good at, what the world needs, what someone will pay me for. And in every, you know, in most jobs today, especially in the information world, or especially as an entrepreneur, every choice we have to, we can choose. Does this get me closer to the center of the bullseye? You know, or is this moving me further from the center of the bullseye, right? I had situations where recruiters would call me and they'd have some big job, right? More money, bigger title. It's like, really? It's. Not, it's not really what I want to do, but I'm excited by the money and the title. <laughs> but, but ultimately, ultimately, we have to choose, like, how do we get closer and closer and closer? And it, it takes a lot of discipline. Even if it's something we want, it takes discipline. It really does. In the, in the book that I'm reading right now, uh, it's, it's called The Heart Aroused by David White. And poetry and the preservation of the soul in corporate America. So that just made me crack up that um, the timing yeah. of our conversation and this, and, <laughs> and this, this wonderful passage that I found inside was that as we're talking about how to nourish ourselves and how to get to the center uh, and, and refresh my memory, the Japanese um, term is what? I ikigai. ikigai. Okay. So to get to Ikigai, Ikigai. Uh, he says, one way to come to yes is to say no to everything that does not nourish and entice our secret inner life out into the world. Or as Rilke said, I want to be with those who know secret things or else alone. 
<laughs> yes, that's fantastic. Right? This is new news. Uh, you, you don't even know this one yet. But uh, two days ago, it was my last day at LinkedIn. And I, I am off choosing to do something else. Again, even after I've had my lottery job, making some choices to continue to be in the center. And as I posted my update on LinkedIn, a friend, you know, a friend sent me something that was about, I'll read this quote. This is from Martin Shaw. As we age, the desire for meaningful work can descend on us almost as strongly as romantic love. The soul reveals the desire for significance, for heft, for some psychic resonance over and over, and will crash our lives against the rocks until we take notice. Oh, that is fantastic. I love that, right? And this is, this is it. This is kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about the full body. Yes. In the, in the context of work, sure. right. It's sure. there's, there's this inner part of it. I call it soul, but whatever, whatever your mental construct or how the world works, this inner part of us that is trying to express itself through our personality, our personality is the body, the mind, the emotions, the things that make up Scott or Shan or whoever, but in the middle of it is soul. We are soul. We have a body, not the other right. way around. And so soul is trying to express itself. But, but the question is, who are we listening to? How are we making decisions? Are we making decisions for the mind or for emotion or sometimes even for the body? Or are we making decisions at that highest, highest, highest part of ourselves as soul? And that's what I was trying to explore with the full body, yes. Mm. Well, well, you nailed it. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there's, there's so, so much anxiety in the world right now due to many things. Of course, the pandemic being a mm. part, an anchor of that. And, and many of our listeners right now are just abhorring the idea of going back to work after working from home, mm. being quarantined, you know, certainly the, the quarantine in itself sure. is, has its own issues. But what questions can they ask themselves when reevaluating whether or not they, they choose to go back, whether or not, you know, what, what choices do they have? Because some of them feel like they don't have a choice. And that's just not true. I mean, I, I get the feeling that you don't have one. That's right. That's where I was going to head as well. Sometimes we literally don't have choice. Sometimes. Most of the time, it's not true. We really do. So as an example, we'll take a simple example, like, you know, when, when we have to go to a staff meeting, right, we're, we're a part of a big company, we're part of a team, part of the tax of the team is going to staff meetings. Now, you, you know, there, and then there are other meetings that we're sometimes hangers on to, you know, we go just to show face or because we think we need to. Now, the question is, do you really have to for anything, for anything that you do? The truth is no, like you don't have to go to that meeting. You don't have to go to work. You don't have to go to that job. Okay, the, there's a consequence for every one of those things, but the consequences are different. And sometimes we, we assume that the have to means this catastrophic thing, like I'm gonna, whatever, lose my job if I don't do something at work or whatever it is, but we have choice, just like we have choice in our relationship. If our partner is really bugging us, we have a choice. We can walk away from it. Now, there's a consequence to that. But here's the thing. When we choose, it's like, okay, I'm mad at my wife or whatever, the, you know, le leaving, well, I'll say something I did, like not cleaning up my own dishes. This is something I did, not something she does. But, but the question is, do I choose to stay with her? Oh, well, yeah, of course. Well, it's not that big a deal. Okay. Well, if I'm choosing to stay with her, then shouldn't my mindset change as well? Instead of just being mad about it. Like the first part is saying, well, I'm in charge of this because I'm choosing to stay. And if I'm choosing to stay, then what can I do to make this better? And this, this thing exists, this choice exists in every moment of every day. And it's this move from victim to player, from, from thinking that life is happening to us to, to thinking that life happens for us which is extraordinarily empowering. And for me, reduces my anxiety. Big time. It's like, oh, I'm in charge. I get to choose. Well, and we often hear from members of our community that 
that making a choice sometimes is so excruciating because mm. they don't want to get it wrong. Uh, and my, my follow-up or feedback to that is get it wrong. Yeah. Make the choice. Just see what, ha- you know, see what happens. Give Because, because you can, I mean, I, I failed a zillion times in this lifetime, but at least I'm making choices. And I don't even know that they were failures. If I kept making choices that led me into something that is, that is more uh, authentically who I am on this earth walk. And that's right. And so, but at the same time, there, there is a part that is just so hard, like so hard to choose. How do I choose? How do I make this choice? I think that part of it is learning to really trust ourselves and to trust that deeper part of ourselves. So can we do a little practice, a little two minute practice? Yes, please. Yeah. So I like this. I know some of you have done it, but I really love this as a way of choosing something when the mind is so busy that it can't decide. And so everybody think of something uh, that you have a choice about and make it like A or B. If you can you know, get things down to choice A or choice B. And look, it could be as simple as what you're going to have for breakfast this morning, but it's way, it's way more powerful and poignant if you choose something that's hard, right? So everybody got something? A or B. Okay, here's the deal. Uh, go ahead and close your eyes and take a deep breath in and let it out. And now bring to mind choice A. You have chosen choice A. And just notice in your body how that feels. Let it roll around. Perhaps let it fast forward in your mind. What is your life like now that you have chosen choice A? What is it like for you, people around you? You are a person who has chosen choice A. Notice how it feels. Okay, now take a deep breath in, let it out. We need a palate cleanser. So for just a second, think about an orange rhinoceros. (laughs) Okay, now take another deep breath in and let it out. And now bring to mind choice B. You have chosen choice B. Let it roll around in you. Perhaps let it fast forward in your mind. What is your life like now that you have chosen choice B? How does it affect you, people around you that you care about? You are a person with choice B in your life. Notice how it feels. All right, and take another deep breath in and out. And just let all that go. And really quickly before the mind gets involved, just notice which one felt more authentically you. Because here's what happens. Like if I said, oh, it's B, but then the mind will go, yeah, but, 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 but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we do the practice. I love that. For me, making choices too is which one feels lighter. What feels lighter to me when, when, when I'm making choice. Well, thank you yeah. for that exercise. That's incredibly helpful. In in the full body, yes. And in chapter eight, I, I love chapter eight, uh, being your own lighthouse, mm. and especially the the section about your daughter and holding it all, uh, and what uh, our young people. I have a daughter that is close to your daughter's age, and anyway, you in that chapter, you say that true mindfulness is having an awareness of the present moment without judgment. Mm. And I wonder how we can practice this at a time when the world is in so much chaos and when it seems like every other person is judging good, bad, (laughs) right, wrong, this camp, that camp, this vaccine, that, you know, na, la, 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 la. These are young adults are in one breath, completely ripped off of experiences that they could have had, should have had, wanted to have it very much like your daughter was like mine was. And then also, at least in my daughter's case, and I think in yours as well, becoming more aware, Mm -hmm. digging in deeper. Um, The conversations I'm having right now with my daughter are phenomenal from, from the level of, you know, where, and so I keep trying to 
uh, well, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm doing it. I'm, I'm noticing yeah. that. I, I'm noticing that while my heart breaks in, in, in some places and then expands while I watch our young people becoming more informed, more aware, and then hopefully able to make better choices in the days to come. Yes. Anyway, that, that was kind of a long question. (laughs) (laughs) I got you. I got you. What did I say? (laughs) Well, I know where to go from here. How about that? Thank you. This, the whole point of life on this planet is to learn how to give and receive love. Uh, And this is my mental model for things. And like all mental models, it's useful, but probably at some point, you know, incomplete or wrong in some way. But my model is I'm soul and I inhabit this body and this uh, personality because I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn more about love. And the world has always had polarity. It's always had, you know, tyrants and bad things happen. Uh, today is just super intense, right? It, because of the 24 hour news cycle. But if I move my mindset from, wow, life is just happening to me. I'm just a victim in all this. Look at all this bad stuff that's happening to what if life is happening for me? What if this whole situation is curated for my and our benefit? If I think of it in that way, this pandemic and all the stuff that comes with it and the polarity that exists in the world, And I move it to thinking about, wow, what a gift. Really, what a gift. Now, in some ways, physically, maybe not a gift. Emotionally, mentally, financially, maybe not a gift. But spiritually, what a gift. Because we've all been forced, really, really forced to stop and do things differently. Because I think that life never gives us more than we can handle. But sometimes it gives us more than we can handle with our current recipe. And so we're forced to change. We're forced to reevaluate. Wait a minute, who am I? Which side am I on? Am I on the left or the right? Or am I on the middle path, the path of love? Right? What, am I going to go back to work? Am I going to get vaxxed or not vaxxed? Am I blue or red or you know, whatever? Or am I just here to love? Because all of this is, in my opinion, an illusion, right? It's a play. And we're, we're watching it and it's so easy to get caught up in it and the, and the nonsense and the things that seem super important on a day-to-day basis. Really, really, it's really hard. But if we view things from the perspective of soul, soul's kind of watching all this going, woohoo, this is what I came here for. This is awesome. Yeah. Let's yeah, go, yeah. let's go. <laughs> Shake things up, turn everything upside down, shine a light on things that haven't been looked at and wake some people up because part of, part of what I see and that as well is the the awakenings and and how much light there really is in the ability for a population to realize that they can no longer just keep bumping along. There, it's not an option, and, and it and it takes us back to choice, doesn't it? We can get sucked into the drama, or we can choose to chart our own path. Mm-hmm. And that's hard. Let's not kid ourselves. Right. Like everything in our whole life guides us down this path, right? When we open our news browser, we're guided. We're, we're being manipulated by both sides, by all sides. And so it's up to us to be that neutral force. Like, who am I going to be in the world? Yeah. Am I going to be tossed around by all this stuff that I read and see? Or am I going to choose what's really, really important to me? I'm going to choose my values and live from a perspective of love. And continue to do it day after day, making that choice, you know, (laughs) moment moment after moment, moment, day after day, you know, who am I going to be today? How am I going to show up to be today? How do I want to be? And, and to eliminate, I realize we can't eliminate 100% screen time. We can't, but we certainly can be more mindful of how much time we're spending there being fed all of this and perhaps swap it out for a walk on the beach or in the woods or sitting in practice or having a conversation with somebody you love or listening to good music or playing music, what, whatever, the, whatever it is you can do to, to really lift that. Because what happens like everything else is the media or the screen time, just, it becomes a habit. It becomes an addiction. It becomes a, the thing that you do. So if you start to break that up, 
I think you're also going to have a much easier time at coming back to, oh, this is what mindfulness is. I'm having an awareness in this moment that this really isn't in my best interest. What choice can I make instead? It's a choice. Here's another one I like. Every thought, word, or deed, or action, either pollutes or purifies. Every thought, deed, or action either pollutes or purifies. Mm. And so after, it's a choice. Then everything that we do, we can kind of, when it's done, or maybe before we start, we can ask ourselves, did that help me? Did that pollute or purify? I'll give you an example. During COVID time, I really got into the show uh, Yellowstone for a while. Have you seen that? I haven't, but I've like heard of, uh, I've heard about it. So it's beautifully done. I grew up on a farm. I kind of identify, you know, with this nature, this rugged guy. But it becomes really dark. Like it's like the Sopranos in a Western set. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's there's solution to everything. You know, the neighbor wrongs you. You just kill them. <laughs> and, and I found myself like feeling gross after every time that I would watch it. And I would replay it in my head for the days following. I would replay these scenes and I found myself being kind of short with my anger, like easy to anger. And finally, I just, I had to give up on it. Even though the plot line was super compelling, the cinematography is super compelling. Okay, pollute or pure. I love that. Absolutely, absolutely polluting. Yeah, I have uh, over the over the I guess probably the last five years or so, my media interests and choices have changed big time to to reflect the uh, the lighter, sweeter, more more time focusing on great and crushing beauty than crushing skulls. Yeah, you know. It's, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yes. So yeah. Yes. And and let's and let's agree like this is hard because the. These things are really compelling. The you know, just, they've done a great job of making it interesting, and it it attracts our minds in a way that's very addicting. Yeah, but we have a choice. And the theme for today's conversation is we have a choice. <laughs> what uh, <laughs> before we uh, before we move on? I what recommendations scott do you have for for young people like our daughters who are who are mm. heading you know finishing up school or heading off to college or just getting started in their careers and and they're just kind of feeling like they're on pretty shaky ground yeah there's so many things because i think if i give hard advice just like my parents gave me when i was 19 I ignore that until I experience the same lesson. Right? Yeah, it's of like course. You, you don't really learn the lesson until you go through the thing. And then it's like, oh yeah, my dad told me. And then it makes sense. But here's one for all of us. Here's one for all of us. And it goes, uh, so just everybody just settle in for a second and put your hand on your heart. And you can have your eyes open or closed. But with your hand on your heart, first just feel your breath up and down with your chest. And then say your name followed by, I love you. So I would say, Scott, I love you, but you try it inwardly. And keep trying it. Let go of any judgment. Let go of any shame or any charge that you think that word might have. And just say it. But even more important, receive it. Really feel it. And that's it. Mm, Thank you. It starts with this recognition that at our root, we are soul. We are love itself. And when we Mm. go back to our true nature, all the hard things get a little bit easier to deal with. Mm, Right on. Scott, thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. I, I know that our listeners are absolutely going to love it. And thank you. Yeah, I just really appreciate you. Um, and congratulations on on your next chapter in in your life. Yeah, as thank you, you. Move forward, and and all the success you've had with your book. I appreciate that. Thanks very much. That was Scott Shoot. 
Get a copy of his book, The Full Body Yes, wherever books are sold. And be sure to visit his website at scottshoot.com.